What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heresy Financial. This is the channel where we talk about financial topics in a way that is considered heresy to the financial establishment. The topic that we are discussing today is whether or not the national debt and the national deficit, the budget deficit, actually matters. There's a lot of news going around lately because the national debt has been exploding at an astronomical rate and the budget deficit has been widening extremely fast. So we're gonna to discuss today if it matters and if it does, why. Let's dive in. All right, guys, the number one reason why you'll hear from the average economist why the national debt doesn't matter is basically because the US government is solvent and they can continue to print and borrow in order to pay off that existing debt and they can always tax in order to pay it off as well. Now, on one hand, they are right about this because if you look at the actual amount of the US debt that we have right now, it's around 22 trillion. That's an absolutely enormous number. But to put it into perspective, we need to look at that number uh, in light of inflation. Now, I've talked about this before that uh, inflation is absolutely a lot higher than what the government admits. And the way that they measure inflation is intentionally deceptive to make us think that there's actually less inflation than there really is. But just for the sake of this argument here, we're gonna look and use the real government official numbers on inflation to see what that $22 trillion really looks like. If you have $10,000 today, that means right now you could go out and you could potentially buy $10,000 worth of goods or services. So that might look like a used car. That might look like a couple brand new MacBooks. That might look like um, a, a couple pieces of really fancy jewelry, or it might look like a couple months worth of expenses if you're using that just to pay for all of your expenses. Maybe that's five or six months of rent. Maybe that's four or five months of a mortgage. Maybe that's a year's worth of your food budget. Who knows, but $10,000 is a significant sum of money that you could use to purchase a wide variety of things right now. Using the government official numbers on inflation, you'd have only needed $8,400 10 years ago to buy the same amount of stuff you can buy today with 10,000. So said another way, 10 years ago, if you had $8,400, you would have needed to add an additional $1,600 to that stack in order to afford the exact same amount of thing today as you would have been able to afford only 10 years ago. Let's go back even further. 20 years ago, that number is 6,500. So again, 20 years ago, if you had $6,500 in your savings account, you would have needed to load that savings account up with an additional $3,500 just to afford the exact same amount of stuff. Now, I know 20 years is a long time and you could absolutely save that up, but the point is that that's how much value your money has lost. $10,000 today, is the same amount of purchasing power as $6,500 was 20 years ago. Now, just so you can see how much value the dollar has lost since abandoning the gold standard, we have to go back 50 years to the year 1969. In 1969, if you wanted enough money to buy you the same amount of stuff that you need $10,000 to buy you today, you would have only needed $1,400. 50 years ago. The dollar has lost 86% of its value officially since 1969. That's 50 years and that's the amount of time that we have not been held to a gold standard, meaning that the government has been able to print as much money as they want. So there's clear evidence that the more money the government prints, the more our dollars lose purchasing power. And again, this is the official government numbers and I'm using the calculator from bls.gov. You can plug in any number and any date you want to see how much your money would have been affected over a certain amount of time. Okay, so why is this important? Well, it means that if you look at that number 22 trillion and you look at it in light of inflation adjusted numbers, the amount of purchasing power that represents is the same as about 14 trillion 20 years ago. And if you take it all the way back to 50 years ago, 
that $22 trillion that represents our purchasing power of our national debt today is equal to about 3.2 trillion 50 years ago before inflation really took off. Now again, that's still an astronomical number, but it's important to remember to keep all numbers in check when you're looking at what that purchasing power represents. Okay, so why is this important? Why are we looking at inflation numbers to determine whether the national debt and the national deficit is important. Historically, when the United States government ran a deficit, that debt would be issued to them by central banks or pensions. You have a large number of very conservative investment funds that are loaning money to the US government because it's considered guaranteed and the safest asset in the world. And so you have central banks all around the world that would jump at the chance to take advantage of a very safe, low yield asset like the United States Treasury. So what does this look like in practice? Well, in practice, it looks like the government receives, let's say $100,000 in taxes. Now, let's say for that year that they actually have $150,000 worth of expenses. So they have a deficit of $50,000. Well, that needs to be funded somehow since they didn't raise enough taxes in order to pay for everything they spent. And so they will issue debt to do that. They'll borrow money. Their treasuries are basically their version of a credit card. So they'll go out into the marketplace and they'll say, hey, we need to borrow $50,000 and we're gonna pay 5% interest on that $50,000 or 10% interest or whatever time period you look at, whatever the interest rate is on treasuries. So again, central banks around the world would say, hey, yep, that seems like a pretty safe debt to invest in. So we'll loan the money and you'll pay it back with the interest. Pension funds will do the same exact thing. And so the government borrowing historically has not been primarily inflationary because they're just borrowing the money from other economies and other countries around the world. But something has changed in recent years and central banks are no longer loaning to the United States government. Some of the biggest central banks that have participated in funding US government deficits in the past, like China, are no longer doing this. In fact, countries like China and Russia and a bunch of countries in Europe are now net sellers of US treasuries. So instead of lending new money to the United States government in return for that interest and that payment back, they're no longer doing that and they're selling off the treasury debt that they already own. So if the United States government just lost its biggest lender and can no longer lend to places like China and Russia and other central banks around Europe, Who's doing the lending? Where are they borrowing from? Well, number one, they're still borrowing from pensions. And so fund managers who are managing the investments inside of retirement accounts and pensions are dumping a ton of money to loan to the United States government, but it's not nearly enough. So who's the one that's gonna step in? Well, in a free market, nobody would step in. That would be just like you or I trying to go get new debt and banks just not approving us because we have so much debt that we can't afford and nobody else wants to loan to us, so why would they? And so maybe if I can't get a car loan, maybe I can get a credit card loan because the interest rate is a lot higher. And so somebody's willing to take on the additional risk to loan to somebody with a lot of debt because the interest that they're gonna get paid back is a lot higher to compensate themselves for the risk of not getting paid back. It would be the same with the United States government. If all of the big lenders stopped lending, well then either the government would have to stop borrowing and they wouldn't have any new money coming in from borrowing in order to fund their deficit spending, or they would have to offer a lot higher interest rate on those loans because then maybe China or Russia or other central banks would say, yeah, I'm not willing to loan to you at you know 2%, 1.5%, but maybe I'm willing to loan to you at 10% or 15%. But if this happened, that means that government debt service skyrockets. That means that the cost of servicing their debt skyrockets because they're not pulling in anywhere enough in taxes to pay for the current outstanding loans plus the interest on them. A massive part of the US budget is spent just paying the interest on its debt. And so if interest rates were to go up and the United States government were to have to pay a higher interest rate to borrow money, just the interest portion on its debt would very quickly turn into the largest part of its budget, be bigger than Medicare and Social Security and military spending combined. It would cripple the United States government. If that's not happening and rates are still low, who is lending to the United States government? It is the Federal Reserve. Now, the Federal Reserve, in order to loan money to the US government, 
by law cannot do it directly. It has to buy these bonds and treasuries from the open market. What that means is that the Federal Reserve is printing money and creating money out of thin air in order to purchase treasuries from the open market from places like China and Russia and European central banks and pension funds that are selling them. Now, this means that there's still enough money in the market coming in to finance that government spending which means that they don't have to raise rates in order to continue to be able to borrow money. Okay, so what's the problem with this? Well, when we turned this corner to where the Federal Reserve was funding a large part of the United States deficit, that's when we see inflation really kick into high gear. And whether you're using the classical definition of inflation, which is the expansion of the money supply, or the current definition of inflation, which is prices increasing, this is a direct cause of inflation and will result in inflation. Prices are going to start to skyrocket. Because in the past, when we would borrow from other central banks around the world, Basically, other economies were funding U.S. consumer spending and U.S. government spending. The government would spend money on Social Security and Medicare and military spending, and you saw a lot of industries inside the United States be able to grow because they were receiving a lot of money. And that money indirectly was just coming from other economies around the world that were loaning money to the United States government that was redirecting that to retirees, sick people, and military companies. So you saw massive booms in industries around the United States that we were basically being funded by borrowing from other countries. But that borrowing is not happening anymore. And so now in order to keep up that spending, which the government wants to do, the only place, the only lender, the lender of last resort, the only place they can go to is the Federal Reserve. But the problem with this is that no longer is it just money coming from other economies. We're not being subsidized by other economies sacrificing their spending. We are just printing the money out of thin air. So the money supply is expanding exponentially. And right now, the pace at which the Federal Reserve is monetizing the government's debt is about $60 billion a month. So that's the, about the same as the amount that the US government spends on military spending every month. So again, just to put that into perspective, that means that the United States government does not have enough money coming in from borrowing from other central banks or pensions or taxes in order to fund the entire military. And so in order to fund the military, they're basically creating money out of thin air. And again, this is money that's just being dumped into our economy that's being created out of thin air, which is inflationary. The money supply is expanding and the direct result of that is prices increasing because there's not a correlated increase in goods and services and production that is financing that growth of money. It's being printed out of thin air by the Federal Reserve. And so this is the real problem with the deficit and with the national debt is that now that we've turned this corner where other central banks primarily are not loaning the government money anymore, we've had to rely on the Federal Reserve to do this. And that's why they restarted quantitative easing, even though they're not calling it quantitative easing anymore. It's the same thing. They're financing government deficits. They're monetizing US government debt. And so that's the real reason why the national debt and the deficit are actually important because it's turned to a spot where it is extremely inflationary. And due to the Cantillon effect, what that shows up in first is asset prices going up, but then after asset prices go up, then other prices go up, and the last prices to go up are wage prices. And so we've seen life get extremely expensive and it will only escalate, and wages are, are usually lagging in when they, the price of wages responds to inflation. And so as life gets more expensive, you see anybody who's able to hold assets benefit from that and the vast majority of the population that doesn't have assets gets left behind as life gets more expensive faster than their wages grow. And so some of the problems that we see right now where there's political polarization and the increase in the wealth gap, those types of things are going to increase exponentially as time goes on because as inflation, real inflation ticks up and increases, less and less institutions that are smart are gonna be loaning the US government money, and that slack will be picked up by the Federal Reserve, which will, in effect, cause even more inflation. So we've started down this inflationary spiral that um, is probably going to take an extremely long time 
uh, to, to solve and to counteract. So that's the reason why the national debt and the national deficit, budget deficit is actually an issue. Hope you enjoyed the content. If you did, please like, please subscribe and share with somebody that you think would enjoy it as well. I really appreciate you guys watching and listening. And if you're interested in my options course on learning how to trade options, I have it linked in the description below. Thanks for watching and have a great day.